Coming off of Easter Sunday, I was in prayer about the movement that God started last Sunday, truly before that. I mean, 250 people in worship. Wow. Bringing a message that our pastor brought us, the reaction, the, the revival that truly took place last Sunday. I would want and I pray that God would carry that into this service today. And I was praising Him and, and thanking Him and praying throughout this week. God, what can I preach Sunday morning that would continue this flow? Last thing I want to do is hinder it. Amen? And many of you know, last month I went to Sublet Road Baptist Church in Arlington and I preached seven messages at a revival at that church. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to preach all seven messages to you this morning. We may be here a while, okay? No, really. I, no. And so I, I started praying. I said, God, what, what can I bring from, from those messages, from that series to LifeBridge? And... You know, as preachers, when you preach revival, you've got a lot of substance. So I prayed really hard to focus on what God would want to share with us today. And there was a message that I brought to Sublet Road on Sunday morning. And it was based on the subject of change. More specifically, that we are called to be culture changers in your environment. Now, I want us to think about what the word culture means here for just a moment. This, this country, this world, has various cultures in it. Amen? Anybody ever been to a foreign country? They're, it's different. And even in different parts of the United States, there's different cultures. Even church culture varies from one body of Christ to another. So if you're just now visiting LifeBridge for the first time, maybe you've been to other churches, you might realize that we're kind of different. Amen? Amen? Okay? So culture varies... But what Jesus commands us to do that we're going to get into this morning in the scriptures is that we must be culture changers to be conformed according to his word and his commandments. Amen? So, I'd like to ask you two questions this morning. Now, before you answer, I want you to think for at least a thousand one count before you answer the question. And don't answer it out loud. First question is this. Do you love God? I would be willing to bet that 99.999998 and three quarters people in this sanctuary said yes to that question. That's pretty basic, is it not? Of course we love God because He first loved us and for many other reasons. The second question is a little bit more challenging. Do you love people? Yeah, I'm hearing some chuckles out there. It's difficult to love people. Amen. Jesus, beyond a shadow of a doubt, exercised and showed us His love in every single thing that He did and said while He walked on this earth, setting for us the example to follow. Now, at the end of this message, we're going to look at those two questions again, so I want you to keep those in the forefront of your mind. Do you love God? And do you love people? Now, Speaking of change, nobody likes change. I mean, nobody, okay? Unless it's a change for the better, of course. But you see, we are creatures of habit. And so the actual definition of change, I believe is in the PowerPoint. It may not be. I'm not sure. Yes, it is. To give a completely different form or appearance. To transform. I want everybody to think of a change that has taken place in your life here recently. Just any change. Could be basic, could be a big change. Like, my life is going to change dramatically in two weeks. Amen? But that's a change for the better. Amen. Yes. So to give a completely different form or appearance to, to transform. Now, in order to understand what you are called to do to this culture, you need to know what change means. That means completely transform. Y'all ever seen the movie Transformers? Man, I love that movie. And I taught an object lesson to some kids one time about that scripture, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. And I took a transformer toy and it you know, went from a truck to you know, Optimus Prime and he became this warrior. And I was like, that's what the word of God does to you. And they were like, whoa, man, that's really cool. Okay? To change, to transform completely. It doesn't stay the same. All right? Now, being that we are creatures of habit, I want you to think about your day to day. You get up at the same time most days. You brush your teeth the exact same way. 
you bathe yourself the exact same way, you put on your clothes the exact same way. Ladies, you put makeup on your face in the exact same process. Can I get an amen? amen. It's true. We eat the same way. We like to go to the same restaurants most of the time. We like regularity. We don't want change. When I was young, I had difficulty remembering to change my underbritches. Thank God Dad was there to get me and Mom was there to get me in line. Okay? So change is difficult for us. I want us to look at seven reasons why people resist change. Seven reasons why you resist change. This applies to you. Reason number one, you feel a loss of control. You feel a loss of control. You see, change interferes with self-rule, okay? And can make people feel that they've lost control over their territory. Hey, we're territorial. I know I am. But I'm about to expand my territory. I'm trying to keep focused on the message. Y'all got to remember, I'm getting married in two weeks, y'all, okay? He's preaching to himself. So, I, amen, that's right. <laughs> Future preacher's wife right there, Amen. Back to feeling a loss of control. Our sense of self-determination. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Our sense of self-determination is often the first thing to go when faced with a potential change. So self-determination melts away when a change is presented to us. Secondly, there's excess uncertainty. If change feels like walking off a cliff blindfolded, then people will reject it. People will often prefer to remain caught in misery than to head toward the unknown. Now, I want to give you a brief scriptural example for that. I don't remember the book of the Bible that it's in, but when the nation of Israel was presented the promised land, God said, there it is, go get it. And then he told Moses, go send 12 spies in there to, to kind of scout it out and then bring it back. The spies came back, 10 out of the 12 said, we can't go in there. There's giants in there and they got fortresses. There's no way that we can get into that promised land. There was excess uncertainty. And in fact, at one point in time, they were like, hey, let's go back to Egypt, back to slavery. We'd rather go back to slavery than to go into that, that the living, true, one and only God promised us. Excess uncertainty holds people back from change. Thirdly, surprise, surprise, hey, Decisions imposed on people suddenly with no time to get used to the idea or prepare for the consequences are generally resisted. You see, it's always easier to say no than yes. I'll give you an example of the surprise, surprise change. As in, you come to a church on Sunday morning and you listen to the Word of God preached in such a bold manner that you yourself are moved to change. Surprise, surprise, God is speaking to you. But you know what's going to happen? The wall's going to go up, and you're going to say, Whoa, preacher, too much uncertainty for me, man. I'm not going that direction. Y'all with me? Surprise, surprise. Another one, everything seems different. Now, change is meant to bring something different, but how different? We are creatures of habit. Okay? Routines become automatic. But change jolts us into consciousness, sometimes in uncomfortable ways. You see, our regularity, our norm, feels good because it's comfortable. That's what we enjoy. We have our routine. We have our process. We have our way of doing things. God forbid it gets jolted into a different reality through change. The fifth one, we have concerns about competence. Can I really do this? Is this really achievable for me to do? Change is resisted when it makes people feel stupid. The sixth one rings true for most men. It's more work. I don't want to do more work. I work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365. I'm on shift work. I'm too busy to change. You know what else is work? Preaching to myself again. You ready for this? Relationship is work. Amen, husbands? And if there is a change that will change you as a person, especially as a spiritual being in Christ, it is a relationship. Amen, brother. Now, I'm just bringing marriage in because 
outside of one's relationship with God, the relationship with the spouse is the second most important. Amen? In that relationship, I mean, let's face it, you live with that person, okay? They sleep next to you most of the time, all right? They are in your space when sometimes it doesn't smell good to be in your space, okay? So you know these people, all right? That's, that's a close relationship, and so it is work to change into who God is calling you to be in that relationship. Amen? But not, not just that. I mean, relationship is just one, one example of many. It's more work to change. Do you know why? Because you must try. You have to. It's something that you consciously decide to do on a daily basis. Not something that you just make a commitment to doing on Sunday morning, and the next day you go right back into that routine. That is not what God calls us to do. Amen? The change that God calls us to make is a daily change. And it's work. And then lastly, there are ripple effects. Like tossing a pebble into a pond, change creates ripples reaching distant, ever-widening circles. Now, I'd like to bring this into the church realm of these ripples that change causes. Because we are creatures of habit, because we like things done a certain way, we fall into a tradition, we fall into a set line of things that you know to do, okay? Because that's the way your mind is trained. And what happens when change approaches that tradition or that way of thinking, and you can see ripple effects beginning to take place, all of a sudden your realm becomes uncomfortable and you reject it. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if there ever comes a time in Life Bridge Baptist Church where this church is not changing to conform unto the image of His Son, that we are not conforming unto the image of His Son, God help us. That's what church is about. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And you know what? Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Because it changes your life. Or it should. And if it's not, and you find yourself in that neutral gear of your tradition... Wake up, people! Today is the day to get out of the tradition and into a change that God calls you to make daily. Feel a loss of control. Excess uncertainty. Surprise, surprise. Everything seems different. Concerns about confidence. Can I really do this? There's more work. And hey, it could cause ripple effects. I may end up sitting some, next to somebody in church that smells bad. It's true. Somebody may come through those doors that I'm not too sure about. If they're, maybe they're supposed to be here. God forbid a sinner walk through those doors of this church. Huh? Change, people. And we follow the example of the culture changer. Can I get an amen on that, church? So, before I get into the message, I had to introduce you to those facts. Because that is what your flesh experiences whenever a change comes your way. And let's face it, anytime you come to this church on Sunday morning, some sort of message is going to be preached about a change that takes place in your life. That, that's what it's about. The, the, the living agent of change is this book. And whenever the word is presented in such a way, you must respond in a form of whatever change God is calling you to do. Yeah, we come here to celebrate. Yes, we come here to give God our worship, but you know what? We've got the privilege to listening to the word of God being spoken. Not for tradition. Not just because we're supposed to, but because all of us need to reach what the Bible actually calls perfection, meaning a completeness in Christ Jesus, and it's a daily process. That's what you're up against. So as we move into the Scriptures, and you begin to feel that resistance, my prayer is that you would set aside your apprehensions and truly allow the living Spirit of God, the culture-changing Spirit of God, to flow through your thoughts and decisions and prayerfully commitments. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And you can turn there if you like. I have it on the, on the screen. 
It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, I have preached several messages based on that scripture this morning, and I kind of wanted to go that direction, but God pulled the reins back, and he said, no, I want you to focus on something else. So I wanted to show you that scripture as biblical proof that once you accept Christ as your Savior, you become something different. Your purpose changes. Your way of thinking should start to change. Now, let me give you an extreme example so we're all on the same page. You've got an alcoholic. An alcoholic comes to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So now he has just entered into a spiritual warfare about the addiction that he has. The next day, if he doesn't conquer his alcoholism, that's okay. But you know what? He receives the power to defeat it in that moment. Are y'all with me? So when somebody receives Christ, they don't receive this automatic switch that, hey, I'm just going to stop sinning automatically. Y'all, believers in Christ still sin. There ain't a person in this room that after you accepted Christ, you stop sinning completely. That's why LifeBridge is a perfect place for imperfect people. Amen? But you become a new creature. The old has gone, and God gives you a new priority. Needed to make sure you understood that. You see, this idea of this culture changer that we're talking about this morning, that's what we're discussing. Because in that moment of salvation, you inherit a new identity. I had one of my young people ask me this morning, he's like, hey man, you're going to be preaching what we're talking about in Teen Life on Wednesdays? Because right now we're in the middle of a revival in Teen Life about this identity crisis that truly... All of this culture suffers from, and again, I was leaning toward preaching that message here this morning, but God said no. But this identity that you're given in Christ is that new creation, and you inherit the power of the culture changer. Now, I want you to think about that for just a moment. That kind of power that you truly have. You have that power. What you must do with that power is engage it daily. To engage that power and to sharpen it and hone it, much like a warrior does. Even when a warrior is not amidst warfare, he's training for it. Amen? You've got that power to be a culture changer. In your community, in your country, in your state, in your city, more than anything in your own home. What's the church culture of your home? There's something to think about. Do you do church on Sunday mornings? Maybe Sunday evenings every once in a while, maybe even a Wednesday night? What are you doing at home? What's your church culture at home? What can you do to change your church culture at home? Husbands, I pray to God that he's convicting you right now to set that tone. That is your responsibility as a husband and a leader in the home. Ladies, encourage him to do it. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is known as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Jesus gave us some instructions before He ascended to be with the Father. And you can turn with me in your Bibles there if you like. It's known as the Great Commission. Now, in Awana, our children memorize Scripture and they get very familiar with them. And I know a lot of seasoned believers in Christ who can <clears throat> quote this verse word for word. But I'm praying this morning that somehow or another God would reveal to you a sense of newness about this verse of Scripture. And Jesus said, beginning in verse 19, He said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I taught you, and I will be with you always, even until the end. Pretty basic scripture. A scripture of comfort, but also a commandment that Jesus gives us. Not only to go and preach, not only to go and teach, but to make disciples. 
Now, the first month and a half of this year, I went through a series about discipleship in teen life. What does it mean to truly be a disciple? And if there's one thing I must say briefly about discipleship, is that all of us are called to be disciples of Christ. Well, what is a disciple, Brandon? I'm really glad you asked, because to get a better understanding of what it means to be a disciple, I need you to look at another scripture. John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Y'all are doing a lot of turning this morning, but just bear with me, okay? This is going to piece together, okay? John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Coming off of this commandment that Jesus says, go and make disciples. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus had just watched his disciples' feet. He predicted his betrayal. And in verse 34, he comes in and he says this, speaking to his disciples. He says, a new command I give you. Now, before we move any further, does anybody remember what the greatest commandment was before this? Does anybody remember it? Love the Lord thy God with all your, all your, y'all know what I'm with, okay? He quoted Deuteronomy there. And then Jesus said, but it's also to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said before this passage of Scripture. Love the Lord your God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. Then he comes in right before his capture and eventual crucifixion and he says this. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Now look at verse 35. This is incredibly powerful. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Wow. Love for one another. Love for people. You see, Jesus' own love and teaching deepens and transforms the former commandments. Do you see that? He actually adds a sense of depth To it doesn't take away from it, but he adds depth to it. And he says, I just gave you an example to follow. To love people as I have loved you. Now, what did Christ eventually do for his disciples and truly all sinners? Everybody, what did he he go on to do? He died. He was crucified. What kind of love is that? It's a sacrificial love. It's a costly love. Amen? And so when Jesus says, hey, you will be known by this love, that you love others as I have loved you, sacrifice. It's hard to do. That that is a sense of depth in this commandment. Unlike truly, we can truly understand and grasp once you think about it. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus did, bringing it back into the culture-changing environment of what he did. Think about what Jesus did. He went where nobody else would go. He hang out with the, the lepers. He healed the lepers when nobody else would touch him. He talked to a Samaritan woman at the well. Now, in that culture, for a Jew to talk to a Samaritan was against the rules. Didn't happen. Jesus defied culture, and he spoke with the woman, and she drank a drink of living water, and she was saved. He healed somebody, and the Pharisees came in and said, Who is this man that heals on the Sabbath? That's tradition. He's breaking tradition. Who is this man? Healing the blind, healing the sick, the woman with the issue of blood that was sick for 13 years, breaking through culture to touch a man. Now, back then, that was against the rules. Things have changed. Okay? That was a joke. And he got to, she got to Jesus, and she touched him, and she was healed. Breaking through culture, people. Jesus went to the unpopular, the unaccepted, the tax collector. He went to his house and had dinner. And every other Pharisee was like, that stinking tax collector. Blech. Taking up taxes for the Romans. He's not popular. He's not one of us. And here comes Jesus and says, hey, what's going on, man? You want to get something to eat later on? Goes to his home and visits with him. 
breaking the ties of culture. Now, those of you who have been watching the movie series, The Bible, or watched it, one of my favorite parts in that entire series, Jesus was on the boat with Peter, and Peter said, what are we going to do? Jesus' response was this, and it was so awesome. He said, change the world. That is exactly why Jesus came down here. But Jesus didn't do it by force. He didn't do it with an army of angels. He didn't do it by any other means but a four-letter word. And you know what that four-letter word is? L-O-V-E. Love. That's how you change a culture, and that's how you change yourself. Through the love of God, people are encouraged to change. They read the commandments out of a love and admiration of what the Father has done. They say, God, I prostrate myself before you now, and I change for your glory. Because of love, not condemnation. How many churches condemn people? How many people walk through church doors expecting love and to be embraced and accepted? And yeah, they've done some bad stuff. And you know what those people do? They shake their finger at them. Like the Pharisees did. You don't fit in here. That's not what Jesus came to do. And that's not what Jesus did. And so when Jesus says to love others as I have loved you, in that commandment, he challenges his believers. Greatly, I believe. Because through that commandment for the believer in Christ to truly understand that, the cream will rise to the top. And the rest will fall away. Sadly, there are people, saved people, believers in Christ, who don't do that. They point fingers. They condemn. They don't accept because of appearances or because of what that person has done. Here's a question that will bring some reality into this church. What if a convicted rapist walked through those doors? What if a Muslim walked through those doors? What if a homosexual walked through those doors? Would you sit back and stare at that person because of what you know or what you see? Would you point fingers? When they sat down next to you, would you scoot over because they make you uncomfortable? Or would you go as Jesus went and embrace them because they are also an awesome spirit being of magnificent worth as a person for they are deeply, deeply loved of God and Jesus died for them no more than he died for you. No difference, people. And once you realize that, once you truly realize that your value doesn't surpass anyone else's, that you are a valued creation of the creator of the universe, and that that person is too, your mind will change. And your perspectives will change. Your decisions and your attitude will change toward those people. And you will love them because Christ loves them too. Christ doesn't love you based on what you've done. Christ doesn't love you because of what you look like. He doesn't love you based on what you can do. He doesn't love you based on anything that you can do. He does not love you on deeds. He loves you because He created you. That's it. There's nothing you can do to earn that love. It's freely given to you already. Plain and simple. And sometimes we, we really can't grasp that concept. And it's mainly through different things. But honestly, self-forgiveness is a big one. People carry the guilt of things they've done in the past. And they see the scripture. And they read it. And they see that God is love. And yes, he is faithful to forgive. But they can't forgive themselves. They don't let that go. And you know what that does to that person on the inside? It affects them, it affects their relationships, and it affects how they love other people. That's what relationship does. It brings out your needs. What do we have with God? A relationship. 
To love as Jesus loved is a powerful thing to do. Is it difficult? You bet. It absolutely is. Matthew chapter 5, if you would turn there with me. I'd like to look at just 10 verses of Scripture. Jesus is speaking to his disciples here. And I feel in this, in this passage of Scripture, when Jesus began his teaching, he had just called his disciples and was baptized and he was tested in the wilderness. And, and then he comes down and, and uh, he says this, picking up in verse 38. He says, you have heard that it was said. Now, when he's saying this, he's bringing his disciples in real close. Okay? You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, I'd like to talk about 38 and 39 here briefly as to what Jesus was speaking of. Back in that culture, an insult came when a person took his right hand and came and backhanded the other person on the face. Now what that does is it leaves that person's palm open to come back and hit the other side in an insult. All right. Now what Jesus is saying here is turn to them the other cheek. As if to say, don't retaliate. Don't snap back in that insult. Don't misinterpret that verse. Defend yourself, people. Okay? Defend yourself. But do not retaliate. Jesus did not retaliate when he was on the cross, did he? Let me tell you something. That, that was a tremendous insult for those Pharisees to crucify the Son of God, was it not? In fact, they mocked him and they said, Hey, come down if you're really the Son of God. Jesus turned the other cheek. Showed us how to do it. You see, in that moment, when you are insulted, what happens when somebody slaps you with an insult, maybe even physically, what you have there is an opening to show them the love of Christ. That's a tremendous opportunity. You ever thought about it that way? I sure didn't. Instead of retaliating, mostly it's verbal for us in this culture, especially with what these young people endure. Instead of retaliating, snapping back with it. Show them love. Because really that other person, deep down inside, they're, they're going through something that you probably don't know what, what they're going through at all. And so you think to yourself, instead of feeling the attack and, and responding with anger and slapping them back with another insult or retaliation of any kind, ask yourself, what hurt is this person going through to display this kind of behavior? And that is a trained response. And that's how you show love. Do not retaliate in that instant. When you feel attacked, don't lash back. Love back. Don't retaliate. Pick it up in verse 40. And if anyone wants to sue you, and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And going off of that, he says, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Has anybody ever asked you to do something, and you were just like, oh. Don't look at him. Or, or there's constantly that person that, that is constantly you know, needing you, needing your attention. And for you mothers and dads, little children, they're that way. Okay? And that's, that's okay. You've got to love them. But let's face it. I mean, it's, it's almost like when they come to you and they're like, hey, would you walk a mile with me? And you're like, uh. Instead of going, uh, go, how, how long do you need to walk? Y'all feeling my drift here? Go the extra mile. Hey, will you take me to the grocery store? Sure. Uh, do you need to pick up anything from the pharmacy? Do you, what else do you need to do? Hey, here's a big one. Can I have 10 bucks? Give them 10 bucks, but give them the gospel too. 
I'll give you a quick story, just a really quick story. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the, uh, my, my uh, young teenage men over at my house. We had a men sleepover, manly men. Uh, we slept separate, just so you know. You know we, we didn't cuddle or anything. And the next morning, I, I got a knock on my door. I thought it was a parent, um, but it was, it was a teenager. And uh, he said, hey, what's up, man? I'm out. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get some cash. Uh, I'll wash your truck for you. I said, how old are you, man? He said, I'm 17. I said, you need some money? He said, yeah. I said, hold on. I'll be right back. So I went to my house. I grabbed some money. I came back out. And uh, I said, look, man, I don't have time to allow you to wash my car, but here's some money. But I want to show you something right here. You got a minute? He said, yeah. Gave him a track. I said, you know, somebody told me this one time, man. I said, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he'll eat for a lifetime. This track talks about somebody that can teach you to fish. And I gave it to him, and he went on his way. Take the time to go the extra mile. You're not in too big a hurry, let's face it. Okay? you got to think like Jesus would think and seize every single opportunity to display love in this culture in order to change it, and it starts with one person. So let's, let's keep moving forward. Verse 43, he continues on, and he says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, wow, what reward do you have? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect or complete, even as your Father is perfect. Now, this is a brief sermonette of this entire message that Jesus was preaching there on the mount. And this is what we can gather from this passage of Scripture. Did you notice what Jesus said? He said, you have heard it was said like this, but I'm telling you it's like this. You have heard it was done this way. I'm telling you to do it like this. Do you know what Jesus was doing here? He was giving instructions to change a culture. That's awesome. You have an instruction booklet to change your culture. Hey man, preacher, I'm glad you're with me this morning. That's what this is. This is an instruction booklet that Jesus gave us through His deeds and through His words. For what purpose? To change the world. Through love. That's what this message is about. I know I'm preaching a whole lot of words to preach one message, but hey, that's what any good preacher does. Amen? We got to get it out. Okay? To love people and to love God. This kind of sacrificial love, again, is a learned response. Gentlemen, in our breakfast yesterday, what did we say? Love is a learned response. You are not born knowing how to love like this. That does not come natural to your soul. Nobody. Okay? When the Bible says you're a born sinner, it doesn't hesitate. So we need assistance in loving like this. Because Jesus said it's easy to love your own. Is it not? Parents, it's easy to love your children, even when they mess up, right? What about loving the unloved? Accepting the unaccepted. Bringing in those that were cast out. That's a challenge. And for any of you who have worked with that kind of person, that is a challenge. And there are victories, and sadly, there are losses. But we praise God for the victories. And we continue to pray for those who are lost. You see, in verse, uh, verse 35 here, let's, let's back up. I don't know. I lost my spot. Let's keep, let's keep moving forward. 
See what I did was I copy pasted in this outline. Like I said, I was bringing in different things. So that was probably from one of the other messages I wrote. So please forgive me. Can I get some grace, people? Amen. All right. Thank you. I love this church. A church that expresses sacrificial love is a church that will grow. There's a church in Deer Park I'd like to tell you about. Uh, it's on Kingsdale Road. And uh, they have worship services at 1030. And last Sunday, during Easter, they, they had about 250 people at their church. And I've spoken with people who have attended their worship services, and I get the same thing from everybody. It's like a big family. There's so much love there. I love going there. You know, and some say it's because it's a small church. Maybe that's the case. I don't know, but we're getting bigger. But you know what? I'm talking about this church, by the way. If we do continue to grow, whether or not we stay like a close-knit family is up to us. Numbers doesn't have anything to do with it. Amen? And we're reaching people because y'all are getting it. Y'all are loving and people have to be loved. Even when their actions and their walls come up and they say, no, I don't want it, deep down inside they're saying, yes, I need it, but I'm so used to resisting, I don't know what else to do. So pursue them as Jesus pursued those he loves. The change process that we commit to daily is the process of allowing God to change us into culture changers for Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question again. Do you love God? Do you love people? The two are not separate. Because in order to love God, the way we are commanded to love God, to be His disciples, you must have a love for people. It must be there. And so truly what I'm talking about is a desire. Do you have a desire for change? And if you don't, if you're still stuck in that tradition, if you're still stuck in that comfort zone of your regularity and you're resisting the change, I'm pleading with you this morning, people, that the spirit of change would work on you and that you'd make a commitment today. That God would place within your soul a deep longing, a yearning for service to Him in discipleship. And that could come in many different ways. I have no idea how God is speaking to you right now. How He could be moving in your mind and in your heart right now in this very second. But I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what He's doing. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the movement that I pray to the living God in this moment is happening in your heart. That you would experience change today like no other day. And maybe you were saved yesterday, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Hey, and if you haven't been shaved, saved, come on. Today is the day. You need to do business with God? I know what you need to do. What is it? What change needs to take place in your life in order for you to be conformed unto the image of the culture changer? Do you love God? So we're going to play a song. And this is your opportunity to respond. This is your invitation. What's it going to be? Do you love God truly? Where's your movement today? Are you stuck in the regularity? Are you stuck in normalcy? It's for you to decide as we stand. You move as God is moving you.